Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and hosted on Thursday, the 13th of April. I'm Kate Andrews, The Spectator's Economics Editor, and your host this week. Coming up on the show, Adrian Woldridge writes in this week's cover piece about the rise of a new elite. Is meritocracy dead? He'll be on the show with Peter Hitchens. Joe Biden was in Belfast this week to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Katie Balls and James Heal will be on the show to give us our politics update. Paul Wood writes in this week's magazine about a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Is it what it seems? He'll be on with Greg Karlstrom. And finally, Mark Mason built his own coffin accidentally. He'll be on to tell us how that happened. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, then do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you want to read more from The Spectator, then why not subscribe to our magazine? For just £12, you can get 12 weeks in print and online and a free £20 Amazon voucher. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer to subscribe. First up, Bloomberg's Adrian Woldridge writes this week's cover story about the death of meritocracy. A new progressive aristocracy is taking over Britain and America, he says. To explain, he joins me now alongside journalist Peter Hitchens. Adrian, Peter, thanks for joining me on Spectator TV. Adrian, you write the cover for this week's magazine where you look at a new kind of attack on meritocracy. What do you say? I say essentially this, that the, in, the, in the pre-modern world, we had um, a society which was hierarchical and in which people were judged according to their membership of groups rather than their uh, individual abilities. Um, so if you're a, a, a woman or if you're a member of the lower classes, you are ipso facto subordinate. And we had since then, since about the middle of the 19th century, a bit before that, we had a liberal revolution which said, no, you must judge people as individuals rather than as members of groups, and you should promote them according to their individual merits uh, rather than their group identities. Um, and the most um, fulfilling version of that was the idea of meritocracy. And I think for a long time, we had this idea of meritocracy broadening and deepening. Um, and particularly after the Second World War, we had a sort of period in which meritocracy was in many ways the ruling ideology of the world. Then we had the left, which had done a great deal to promote meritocracy, turning against the idea of meritocracy, saying that it perverted socialism from an idea, ideal of equality to one of uh, competition. Um, and that you should get rid of these awful institutions like the 11 plus and grammar schools. That anti-meritocratic re revolution uh, happened, uh, but it began to run out of steam a bit. Mrs. Thatcher pushed back against it by saying that we need meritocracy, but the, 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 the ideal vehicle of meritocracy is the market rather than the state. Um, and Tony Blair, to some extent, New Labour pushed back against it by accepting league tables and academic schools. But now what we have is another big push against meritocracy. This time it's being done in the name of woke rather than in the name of uh, equality, comprehensive schools, egalitarianism. Uh, but it's much more serious this time than it was last time because it presents an alternative hierarchy uh, to the world. And that hierarchy is a hierarchy of virtue rather than the hierarchy of um, rather than, uh, uh, equality. And what this hierarchy does is to reinvent the pre-modern world uh, in some ways to say that we should judge people on the basis of their group identities. This is the right way to be looking at the world, um, but we must invert the old pyramid that oppressed groups should be judged to be virtuous uh, in the way that the old ruling class was judged to be virtuous and that we must get, get rid of this idea of judging people on individual merits because it's a deceit, it's a lie, it's a way of perpetuating uh, privilege. So this is once, at once a sort of more vigorous attack on meritocracy and an assertion of a different way of organizing the world, organizing the world according to, according to virtue as conceived by, by, by the woke elite, rather than individual merit. In other words, it's the most significant attack we've seen on the liberal idea, I think, in my lifetime. Peter, let's break down this concept of meritocracy a little bit. It's quite popular to say these days that meritocracy doesn't really exist, that hard work doesn't get you anywhere. What do you make of the concept of meritocracy? Do you think one exists in the UK? 
I'm not sure a concept existed, but I think a fact has, has probably always existed. Naturally, any intelligent society tends towards a certain amount of meritocracy. Any society which ignores the existence of talent in its midst and doesn't, uh, and doesn't bring it on and, uh, and make the maximum use of it is a foolish society. And I think there are a lot of occasions during our history when we have overcome snobbery and all kinds of other barriers and, and said to people they should be promoted on their merits. I'm not sure the left, by the way, was trying to, to, to attack meritocracy when it, to, when it attacked grammar schools particularly. The, Michael Young's book on the rise of the meritocracy was, was his own quirky view that meritocracy would lead to some, to some kind of hideous society where people resented the justice of the position they found themselves in. I don't think most people ever felt that. The, the left foolishly believed uh, that by opening up certificates to everybody, uh, they opened up the knowledge that ought to go with them to everybody. And so we have a society of, of, of huge numbers of certificates and very little knowledge, which is, is, is probably not what they intended, but it is what they got. Adrian, can you talk us through how you think this latest wave started and why you think it's arguably more intense than previous waves? Well, it started in American academia in many ways um, in the 1990s with the development of, of, of critical race theory and new waves of feminism. Um, and the, the unique thing about these ideas is that they started off with the belief that judging people as individuals and embracing the idea of meritocracy um, is a delusion uh, because individuals are caught up in a web of relations which, um, w w w which are more important than their individual qualities and because society is structurally unjust. So the only way to get about this is not to give in to this bourgeois ideal of meritocracy, but to look at these structural um, problems and overcome them through group collective action rather than individual action. So it was, a, it was a university idea that uh, very strangely has permeated the whole of society. Um, and particularly it's made this strange transition from quite radical university departments, uh, or in some ways what seemed like quite marginal university departments, to the heart of the corporation through human resource departments. Um, and human resource, most corporations now, uh, particularly in the United States, but spreading right, right across the world, are committed to something called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this word equity is an extraordinarily powerful word because it says that what we should be aiming at um, in business is not equality of opportunity, which is the old meritocratic ideal, but in some ways of equality of results. And some strange people <laughs> believe in equality of results, but it's a very radical reinterpretation of what society should be about. And one of the th strangest things that's happened is that a lot of radicals have come to the conclusion that the best way to pursue their ends is not by overturning capitalism, but by transforming capitalism from within, capturing things like, uh, like, like human resource departments and working within corporations to define their ends in very new ways. Peter Adrian mentions academics there and university campuses where he thinks has started to bubble up. In his piece, he talks about Cambridge academic Priyam Vada Gopal, who has said things like abolish whiteness. What do you make of this? I mean, should we really be too worried about some rogue comments that are said from academics on university campuses? Well, it does seem to spread quite quickly out of universities, doesn't it? So we should worry about it because it obviously has an appeal. I think the appeal that it has is the one which Adrian mentioned at the beginning, the appeal of virtue that we live in a society where the, the, the old concepts of virtue, which were based on Christianity, have more or less died away. It's not, it's not known or understood as a religion or as a set of principles or as a moral system by millions of people who find themselves even so craving, as I think almost everybody does, for some sort of guidance as to how to be good. And here we, here we have a whole new set of beliefs which provides a set of guidance in how to be good. And it's unrecognizable and mysterious to me because I grew up in a different one, but I think we have to understand that fundamentally, it, it's, it's, it, however much damage it does, it's born on, on the wings of, of, a, of a desire which most of us can understand as reasonable. The problem is, uh, it's wrong <laughs> that they, they have not got, uh, they've not got it right. They've, got, they've become obsessed with, uh, with climate change. They've become obsessed with sexual politics. And they've also become obsessed, and this I think is the result of a definite campaign rather than collapse of, of, of the Christian religion, they've become obsessed with, with getting rid of the, the patriarchy and of, uh, and of actually making a profound and final attack 
uh, on what we used to view as the family. I think the real sufferer in all this is the family, and the real gainer in the end will be the state. Uh, but it, it, as with so many disastrous developments in modern civilization, it's based on a, on, on, a, on a benevolent wish. But unfortunately, the benevolent wish will not turn out to, to, to be as benevolent in practice as it was in theory. And Adrian, in your cover piece, you add another element to this, and you say it's one of the biggest aspects of this new attack on meritocracy, and that, of course, is race. What do you think has changed in our conversations in the West about race over these past few years? I think what's happened with, with, with the, the, this new the, this version of woke that we now have is that race has become much more central. They've sort of thrown race into the very center of these things. Um, and they've added to throwing race into the center of these things a sort of deceit, because the notion is that the problems, the very real problems of racial inequality can only be solved through collective action and through the identification of, of people with their, their racial identity rather than with any, any other sort of identity. I would say that within the meritocratic framework, we had already taken very significant steps towards um, removing um, barriers to uh, uh, ethnic minorities um, from being successful. You know, in this country, we have many members of, the, of ethnic minorities in the cabinet, many members of ethnic minorities doing extremely well at school. Perhaps the most successful school in the country is the Brampton Manor Academy in, uh, in East London. Um, so we were, through meritocracy, um, addressing uh, long-term uh, inequalities of opportunity. But what the, the woke do is to say that that's an impossibility. You can't do that, that, that meritocracy is inherently racist. It's saturated with, uh, with, with racism. And the only way to overcome injustice is not to, not to look at individual ability or individual effort, but to have collective uh, categories, collective struggles and, co and a collective focus on these hidden forces of racism, which are, which are everywhere in society. So they have, as it were, they've come in at a time when, when, when you know, people have never been freer, certainly in, in advanced countries of, of, of racial bias, prejudice, and said, no, 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 uh, you're wrong, you're not free, you're absolutely, all of these things are very deeply involved in what you think, what you do in society, and it's only through a process of collective action, um, doing the work, that we can solve these problems. Peter, one of the things I found really interesting about Adrian's cover piece is that he doesn't let the right off the hook. Um, he talks about the right's own assault on meritocracy, calling it um, the form of populist rage rather than high Tory worry about social mobility. What do you make of that? Do you think the right is just as complicit in this attack? Well, there isn't really a right left, is there? There, is a, there are people who consider themselves to be on the right who are in many cases just market liberals who have no real social theory at all, who've, who long ago left behind uh, the precepts of Christianity, uh, who aren't uh, socially or morally particularly conservative and who are happy uh, for society to be extremely relaxed on those, on, on those matters. And so they haven't really got an argument. Half the problem with the supposed right in this country is that it has long ago accepted or failed to challenge and therefore come to live with uh, the things which the left have been demanding, particularly in the, in, in the areas of, of sexual politics and of the, again, the, the, the strength and importance of the, of the married family. They've just given in. They have nothing particular to say except let's have more, let, let's, let's have more markets. Uh, let's have more free trade. Uh, what, how, is, how, how is this any kind of answer? to the enormous, if slightly confused and, uh, and uh, in some cases bizarre, moral array of the, new, of the new left which we face. You're describing the classical wing of the Tory party, which I would argue is, has really actually dwindled over the years, but that's, that's one wing. Of course, there's another wing, which I think Adrian is referring to, although he can jump in here and, and correct me if I'm wrong, which does have that more populist take. Actually, they might be more economically liberal, more socially conservative, but crucially, are quite happy to engage in the culture wars. Well, I, I don't see much trace of it, honestly. I, I don't think that the, 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 the occasional Jordan Peterson outburst makes much difference to the enormous preponderance 
of the other point of view, particularly on campuses, uh, or has really much of an answer to it. If you if you didn't fight, as the as the conservative parties of the of the Western nations did not fight the cultural and moral wars of the 1950s and 1960s, you haven't got much left to say when, this, when, when we arrive at this stage because you've given in over so many of, of the earlier battles that you really have no position from which to stand. I think there's a, maybe there's a realisation which I, I think everybody who's on the conservative side of society needs to make uh, that we've lost uh, and that there's very little chance of getting anything back. Uh, and that is probably the only realistic position to take. But the reasons why we lost was uh, lie in, in battles long ago. I would say that really and truly, if you wanted to combat these, these developments, you needed to combat them back in the, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, when the other side were thinking very hard about them indeed. Uh, people like Roy Jenkins and Natalie Crossland to begin with. And then after that, the, the, the theorists who brought us to what, what, is, what became called political correctness. A huge revolution in the way we behaved and organized our society, which the supposed right had no answer to except more market. Adrian, it's interesting to me in your piece that you say that the conservatives essentially should feel shame for the rise of the woke aristocracy under their control. I mean, in this country, they have been in power for well over a decade. Uh, absolutely. I would, say, I would say about the populist right, I think the populist right is, is, is a very significant force, uh, primarily in the United States, this sort of Jacksonian tradition uh, that is embodied by, by Trump. And that's a, 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 a populist sentiment which is really against elites of various sorts, but particularly against the sort of the pointy headed elites of universities and, and bureaucracies. And we see elements of that in the, in the conservative part party here that, uh, you know, the, the, the Nadine Doris talking about posh boys who don't know the price of milk and, uh, and, and all the rest of it. These are, they, they're saying that these people are out of touch with the, the common people and their great common sense, uh, and that they're somehow, um, deluded people. I think Brexit was a manifestation of that sort of populist anger. Again, Trump, uh, obviously so. I think in the question of the, um, the fight against wokery my, and the laziness of the Conservative Party. I think wokery is the wrong answer to some real questions. Uh, the real questions are why are certain groups in this country um, trapped in poverty? Why do other groups continue to dominate uh, society and continue to get an unfair share of the rewards of that society? And I think there are certain um, answers to that question which can be delivered by looking at the meritocratic tradition and modifying it, improving it for, 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 for the modern world. I think the Brampton Manor Academy, various academically selective schools that try and reach out to poorer people are examples of that. But we haven't pushed far enough on that. Uh, we've talked about leveling up, but we haven't talked anything uh, uh, like enough about uh, spreading excellence throughout the country and increasing opportunities about the country. And so woke us, uh, as, uh, has arisen partly, as Peter has said, um, as a way of sl slaking our, our appetite for, for virtue, but partly as incorrect solutions to very, very real uh, problems. And I think that we have to try harder, not only to address these problems, but to, you know, almost to crow that we are address it, uh, addressing them, or we will have the work is doing what, what, what I think they're doing, which is to smuggle in a pre-modern way of thinking about the world into, 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 into modernity, a pre-liberal way of looking at the world, which I think is profoundly unhelpful. Peter and Adrian, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Now to politics. President Joe Biden was in Belfast this week to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. We've also discovered Labour is willing to try out a new kind of attack ad on the Prime Minister. To tell us about the latest update in politics, Katie Balls and James Heal join me now. Katie and James, thanks for joining me. Uh, Katie, this week US President Joe Biden has come to town. Uh, he came to Belfast to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, but he didn't stay long. Yes, and there was a debate as to whether this was a bilateral between Rishi Sunak and Joe Biden or a bilate. Uh, a bilate is the term used by one US official to the New York Times. It was that uh, brief. Yeah, so brief. 
they could not go for uh, the, the, an official meeting in that sense. Um, and of course, as ever, as the needy partner in the special relationship, uh, the UK and specifically Downing Street, I know it's definitely a bilateral. Um, and also since it happened, uh, figures in government say it actually went on even longer than it was meant to in the diary. Um, so they were really getting on. They had two coffees. <laughs> yeah, I think there was actually tea in the end. Right. That obviously works less well. Um, but I think... I, I, I suppose there's two things about Joe Biden's visit. So the first of us is the reason he is actually here, um, and that is the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, as you say. And I think when Downing Street first imagined the trip, um, the hope had been you would have a store one up and running. Um, that's not been the case. And instead, Joe Biden had to use his uh, speech in Belfast to say, of his, to speak of his hope that the parties get together, uh, that power sharing is restored, um, which is clearly some way off. And then the second part of that is um, ultimately, I suppose, the special relationship and Rishi Sunak's relationship with Joe Biden. And in that meeting afterwards, you had uh, the Prime Minister quite keen to talk up uh, progress on investment in Northern Ireland. I think that's almost the carrot Joe Biden was trying to dangle, which is there'll be a lot more investment if you can <laughs> uh, you know, have, have Stormont in operation. Um, and then also talking about security and other matters. I think that given it happened on the same day, as Liz Truss gave a speech in Washington in which she specifically cited Joe Biden as uh, part of the unprecedented opposition she faced um, on her mini budget. If you remember, Joe Biden came out against the 45p tax rate. I think it served as a reminder that while the relationship, you know, by latte, bilateral, you know, why it wasn't the longest visit, ultimately Rishi Sunak is in a better place to have a constructive relationship with Joe Biden and the White House than his two predecessors and I think a lot of that's down to the Windsor framework which yes it hasn't restored Stormont but it does mean that you have uh, you know a, a groundwork for much better relations um, both with the US and with Europe because you no longer have this threat of unilateral legal action through the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill and then also I think just Rishi Sunak's um, general approach is slightly less uh, Robust, I think, might be the wrong word because I think they're still asking things behind the scenes. But definitely, in public, um, unlike Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, I think less volatile statements, which I think means it's easier to have a charm offensive. I think there's um, a danger in journalists often we sort of jump on things as a sign of any kind of you know split or weakness in the relationship. So the discussion around bilateral, bilateral, for instance, and it's something that happens with every prime minister. Remember, I think Gordon Brown in 2008-9 was in America, and the, his officials were briefing here a lengthy meeting with President Obama. And it later materialised as actually been a sort of walk and talk through the kitchen of the White House um, when they were discussing how to respond to the global financial crash. I think that Rishi Sunak is a bit uh, hindered in the respect that, you know, you look at the closest relationships between presidents and prime ministers in the past, um, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, to give two examples. They were forged before one of the partners entered office. So I think Margaret Thatcher first met Ronald Reagan in the late 1970s before she became into number 10. Rishi Sunak, obviously, because he's such a young politician, novel hasn't had those kind of connections with the side but I think he has done well as Katie said and I think actually the point is after a kind of confusion which was quite low relations because of the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol you have to look at the kind of actual strategic outcomes and AUKUS has been signed and I think that is a reflection of how important the relationship with American Britain is even if perhaps the protagonists don't have a particularly close or warm relationship at the time. But James a lot of people are criticizing Joe Biden for leaving Northern Ireland so quickly and heading to the Republic. Now we all know that Joe Biden really plays up his heritage, it's mm -hmm. something that means a lot to him so this trip is probably a heartfelt one as much as it is a political one and that may well be where his, his heart is pulling him to but um, is it right to question why he left so quickly especially given the nature of the Special relationship? Well, I think it's fairness to Joe Biden uh, is that you know there isn't the Northern Ireland Assembly which he wanted to address because they haven't been able to uh, appoint a speaker to ensure that process. So there wasn't too much for him there. I think I think Katie made this point excellently on the coffee house shots yesterday, which was that you know we we I think a lot of maybe Brits you know will see President Biden in one way, but he, how he's perceived in Northern Ireland is quite a different one. You know he was meant to be going to Northern Ireland, sort of talk to all the parties involved in the storm of the power um, power sharing um, issue. But he wasn't seen as an honest broker by some of the, you know, the DUP and the unions who've come out very strongly against the Stormont break. So I think that there is a danger, actually, if he, he had been there for a number of days and maybe made a few more gaffes and kind of was seen as hectoring the Northern Irish, that had dangers too. So he has now gone to Project Island, where, frankly, his sympathies lie. And it's a much more kind of fun trip, shall we say, than the Northern Island leg of the tour. So he's doing things like tree planting and seeing his old relatives distantly removed. Um, so I'm sure he'll enjoy that much more.
And Katie, you made the point before that Rishi Sunak arguably is in a better position to have a relationship with Joe Biden than his two predecessors. So a one-off trip perhaps isn't the biggest deal if Joe Biden leaves early. He is in a better position to perhaps speak to the president whenever he wants. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately this is not the first time Rishi Sunak and Joe Biden have met since he has entered number 10. Um, there is, of course, the big uh, Good Friday um, anniversary event coming up in the next week, um, one where you have the Clintons, you have King Charles. And I, and I think perhaps in an ideal world, um, the, the preference in government would have been for Joe Biden to attend that one. Um, it did not work for various holiday reasons, perhaps um, wanting to have the full the full uh, stare of attention on his trip. Um, but I suppose where I think there might be, you know, some disappointment is the fact that you have the coronation coming up mm -hmm. and Joe Biden is not planning to attend that. Instead, it would be his wife, Jill Biden, attending in his place. And I think that would have been something which would have been taken as, I suppose, uh, a sign of the strength of the relationship had he managed to attend it. But, but generally speaking, I, I don't think uh, Number 10 are particularly worried about these opportunities. James, also this week there has been a lot of attention on Labour's new attack ads against the Tory government and Rishi Sunak. At the end of last week, we saw a new ad which got a lot of attention over the weekend and into this week, uh, in which uh, the Labour Party suggests that the Prime Minister is sympathetic to people who would sexually abuse children. Uh, you write about it for the magazine this week. Yeah, so this is part of a sort of wider theme in the run-up to the local elections this year. So last week there was a focus from Labour on uh, law and order, crime. This week it's more cost of living, and then next week it's the plan is for, for health. And so they released these new graphics on uh, Thursday last week, uh, and it was obviously on the quite incendiary issue of child sex abuse. Uh, and they followed up with subsequent ones on crime, and then also taking aim at Rishi Sunak's wife over her, her tax affairs as well. Um, and our Labour opposed the use of those adverts for the time being, but I think they're really seeing these mayor local elections as a dry run, as a dress rehearsal, as one aide told me, before next year's general. It's kind of seeing what works. They've taken on a number of um, digital people, they've taken on new content producers, and they want to kind of see how you can get the best out of that. And I think if you talk to people in Labour, there's a sort of range of opinions as to how well they've gone. You know, some of them are quite, you know, phlegmatic, and they say, well, you know, we, the Tories are always going to attack us, we just need to get our side out first, they were never going to play by Queensby rules. Others are a little bit more cautious. And I suppose the question I really frame at the heart of this week's column is that Labour have the, have the ambition to win, but do they have the will? Are they going to see it through? Are they going to, if they want to fight hard, are they going to be actually able to back it up? And you look at what happened in the two media rounds on Good Friday and Easter Monday with Lucy Powell and Emily Thornberry. And both of those gave, I think, um, less than... Um, less than convincing performances about that. And I think that shows the difficulty facing the Labour spokesman is that if they're going to actually campaign like a sort of vote leave machine, are they going to be as good as Michael Gove and Boris Johnson were in relentlessly repeating those messages? Uh, so I still think there's a bit of sort of, in Labour, there's a few tensions around that. And then in terms of the Tory response to that, I think they're waiting to see, uh, waiting for the time being, trying to focus on Rishi Suna, building him up as a competent Prime Minister, Keir Starmer merely shouting from the sidelines. Uh, and then they're going to hit back with sort of ammunition from the time as DPP uh, next year. Katie, um, there's the frustrations within the different political parties about this ad and whether or not they support it, if specifically in Labour, whether or not they support it, or whether or not they think the Labour Party went too far. I'm curious though as to how it's landing with people. I mean, attacking Rishi Sunak on a topic like that just doesn't feel like it's going to seem credible, I think, in a lot of people's minds, given what they know about the current prime minister. But perhaps Labour feels differently. Maybe they think, gosh, this could have cut through. Yes, I think it's an interesting one in the sense we don't yet have that many polls back and whether it has affected you know, the main party poll leads. Some people I know in focus groups said they don't think it's landing particularly well. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, partly the point of attack campaigns like this is not so people think what a fantastic advert and it's so you entrench a negative message and people remember that so you know it's um it's less is less in the sense of you know trying to endear people to Keir Starmer um, but I think it's a higher risk for Labour in the sense uh, that lots of people expect Labour and particularly Labour voters uh, a high portion uh, like the idea of having a political leader that acts for integrity when they go low we go high rises above um, it exactly and therefore I actually think um, it's 
is more risky for Labour, and you can see that in terms of the internal splits this week, to take this route because, um, and lots of voters want trust and honesty in politics, no matter which party you are, but I think the particular is a part of Labour that takes comfort in this idea that they operate, or they like to tell themselves to higher standards than the Tories. Um, that's part, and you had a situation where the Tories this week, I think, effectively said, we're not going to reply to this, we're not going to say much at all, let's just wait because we think Labour are going to tear chunks out of each other, and lo and behold. Mm -hmm. And to your um, point about how effective it is, I think speaking to various figures who've worked on attack ads for the Tory party, the whole point is you pick something that people already vaguely think right. or is in some part of their mind and then you use probably an outrageous attack And as. people were not thinking this. So then, whereas, as you point out, not that many people sat at home thinking, you know what I think about Rishi Sunak? Right. He is a paedophile sympathiser. Um, he is lenient on sentences. And that's why I think the first ad, um, is it's you don't quite get the logic of it. Now, it did get them attention. I think if you look at some of the other ads, and I think non-DOM is something that uh, you know Labour plan to keep on going on. They've done it previously, but perhaps in a more personal way against Rishi Sunak's wife. Um, I think that at least uh, points to, you know, if you think about the big row of the non-DOM status when it first came out, points to discomfort the, uh, you know, a portion of the public had. So you can see how that one could be used in the future. But again, you have to be so careful with these attacks because, as James points out, you need a, a party that's willing to get behind it, and there's clearly lots of doubts. But also, what about when you go too far? So if you have a, you know, a campaign where you go after a specific person of their tax status, and then that person starts to get threats, vile abuse, um, are you going to have a Labour leader who then apologises? Mm -hmm. Or who says, you know, that's not the thing? And I, and I think you've got to think through it in that many stages. And I, So I think it's interesting that despite all the multiple briefings about what a triumph this has been for Labour by figures in Labour, which is partly to signal to uneasy Labour MPs to you know, get behind the strategy, it's interesting that it's being paused and there's not yet a date for it to come back. And James, also going on this week, indeed right now, is the four-day walkout of the junior doctors. This is the longest strike in NHS history. Uh, the doctors in the British Medical Association are calling for a 35% pay increase for junior doctors. The government has been quite quiet so far. Why do you think that is? I think there's always a risk attached to um, medical strikes. I mean, you remember, of course, you know, of course the affection that the NHS has held in. Um, historically, strikes involving nurses or doctors tend to be won by the strikers. You know, Margaret Thatcher had one with the ambulance workers at the end of the 1980s and early 1990. Um, so there's that obvious reason. But also, I think that there's perhaps a sense of you know, the, the strike, I think the, the doctors have a decent case for making a pay rise, but a 35% one, I think, to most people seems somewhat bit high. And I think the government are saying they don't actually need to go and sort of attack anything. They've sort of made their position clear. And I think they're hoping at some point they'll come to the negotiating table. But I think, if anything, the sort of two sides' positions have hardened in, in recent days from some of the rhetoric earlier. And I think that, as you say, Kate, it is designed in such a way that it's taking place within this kind of four-day week between Tuesday and Friday of this week. But, of course, that's in the wider Easter, you know, bank holiday period, which means they're expecting 10 or 11 days of disruption. So we could see anywhere up to 300,000 appointments and operations cancelled. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie, it doesn't seem like the government is anywhere near accepting the things that they're demanding. No, and I think ultimately the question is, you know, where is the landing zone? Because we've obviously heard in the past there won't be talks on these demands and then eventually there's something. I think though if you compare this to the nurses' strikes, there was much greater sympathy when Downing Street for nurses and also, importantly, much greater public sympathy, mm -hmm. um, which clearly is a big factor in these in these things. Um, so that is, I think, one reason, I think, in terms of the junior doctors and the level they're asking for, where there's less we need to run to it. But of course, at the end of the day, disruption, people not getting appointments, eventually the government will be blamed for that. Um, if, if the country doesn't feel like it's working, I, I think that is something which any governing party is going to struggle with. So they'll need to find some way for it. But I, I think that the level of demand and where they're at means this um, fight has some way to go. Mm. And I, I would just be interested to see how, when Parliament returns on Monday, um, I think over the recess period, maybe perhaps some of the kind of vicissitudes and debates around this subject have been sort of a bit more muted. I mean, we've seen the Lib Dems call for an emergency recall of Parliament, but other than that, I think perhaps this might have had more kind of effect, more debates in Parliament. It might be raised at PMQs, but obviously it hasn't been because of the recess. So I'll be interested to see what the kind of ramifications are when Parliament comes back on Monday. Of course, Katie, it, the biggest question is for the government, but there's also a question for Labour here because uh, the BMA is uh, demanding such 
a hefty pay increase, it would be very difficult for labor to come out and even suggest that they would just deliver that. I mean, we're talking about you know a lot of money that would be put forward indefinitely, right? Because these are for not just salaries, but pensions in the future. Um, you know, it's, it's a tricky question for any politician about how you fund this. Yeah, and Labour have repeatedly fudged um, their response to the strikes because they are in a difficult place where they don't want to look, you know, in hock to the unions, um, but they also don't want to um, have their, you know, their base. And also many of their own MPs turn against them. If you think about the edict of, you know, don't appear on the picket line, um, then it's like, oh, no, we're saying exactly don't appear on the picket line. We're just saying don't do broadcast media from the picket line, like Sam Terry. Um, he got in trouble on it. It's uh, a technicality you know, there. And then some shadow, shadow cabinet members found a, a way to, you know, appear near a picket line um, and I think it just is one of those things where Rachel Reeves is very reluctant it has been in the past to get into what exact figures Labour would go for instead you hear you know let's get these sides talking get round the table that's what Labour like to say and I think um, as you get closer to an election and as they continue to be ahead in the polls even if it is reducing slightly and um, it's much harder to get away with that I think people are, are looking for answers rather than just um, a situation where I think if you perhaps combine it with some of the attack ads I do think a, a growing theme is what is Labour saying on things because we know what they don't like we know what they that they, they think the Tories are rubbish um, but I think the more that this goes on in particular I think their attack as of pointing out negativity we're not coming up with something themselves it means that you have a situation where they're under increasing pressure to put forward um, not their own policy there are plenty but specific answers to problems as they come up and the unifying thing here is the fiscal conservatism of Rachel Reeves who's keeping a very tight hold on the purse string so you look at the Labour attack ads for instance they were weakened by the fact that Labour isn't going to expand the prison estate I'm going to put more money into more prison places for people like child sex abusers and on this one of course as well they're not talking about a sort of funded figure increase so I think there'll be more constraints within the shadow more calls within the shadow cabinet for those purse strings perhaps to be loosened but of course so much of the money is tied up in uh, the Green New Deal project so that will be I think perhaps a behind the scenes tension in the months to come. Katie and James, thanks for joining me. Spectator contributor Paul Wood writes in this week's magazine about a political reordering in the Middle East. Old enemies seem to be making up, he says. Is that really such good news? Paul joins me now alongside The Economist Middle East correspondent Greg Kallstrom. Paul, Greg, thanks for joining me on Spectator TV. Paul, you write for the magazine this week about the peace deal that has been brokered between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You also write about the worsening tensions between Iran and Israel and the role of China and America in the Middle East right now. Talk us through what you write for the magazine. Well, calling it a peace deal um, really is an inflating what's happened here. It's normalization of relations between two countries which have been at each other's throats for decades. And really, the, the fundamentals of the conflict haven't changed. Seven years ago, uh, they cut off formal diplomatic relations. Um, the Saudis executed a Shia cleric, uh, and then um, Iranian uh, protesters stormed the Saudi consulate. So they've agreed to reopen uh, their diplomatic missions. They've agreed to talk about trade, to talk about more talks. Um, this certainly is a stunning upset, um, not least because China brokered this deal and not the United States. But it's not peace in our time in the Middle East. First of all, the fundamentals of the enmity between the rulers in Riyadh and the rulers in Tehran haven't changed. After all, remember that the Soviet Union and the United States had formal diplomatic relations during the decades of the Cold War. Um, it also means that Iran um, probably has more freedom of action against Israel, and the Israelis certainly feel that they're in a weaker position now. So yes, this is a peace deal. It doesn't mean that peace is breaking out all over the Middle East. And indeed, it remains as dangerous and perhaps more dangerous, particularly because Iran may feel it has more freedom of action against Israel. Mm. Greg, what do you make of the peace deal? As Paul notes, these countries were once sworn enemies. What will have changed through this deal? And I think Paul is right to say calling it a peace deal gives it too much credit. Uh, this is a return to the way things were in some ways in 2015. If you go back to 2015, yes, Saudi and Iran had diplomatic relations. They had flights to each other's countries and a bit of trade. Uh, but they were also at that point backing opposing sides in the civil war in Syria. They were backing opposing sides in uh, the nascent conflict in Yemen. Uh, the Saudis a few years prior to that had accused the Iranians of trying to assassinate their ambassador in Washington. Uh, there were all sorts of, of very deep issues in this relationship that date back to the Islamic Revolution in 1979. So what they have agreed to now is, I think, out of a sense of mutual exhaustion on both sides to try and lower tensions and to try and focus on uh, 
uh, domestic matters. For the Saudis, that really means Vision 2030. It means their grandiose plan to uh, diversify their economy and try to transition it away from oil. Uh, and for the Iranians also, there's a, a domestic component to this. The regime, in many ways, you can say uh, its legitimacy is at perhaps the lowest point since 1979. We saw this uh, late last year with months of protests against the regime. The economy is a train wreck. Uh, the currency is all but worthless. And so for both countries, after a decade when they were really at each other's throats uh, across the region, there's a desire, desire to at least lower tensions enough and, and be able to focus on uh, domestic matters for a while. Paul, while you say that peace deal is, is overstating what's happened, uh, the deal certainly has a big impact on Israel. And you write in the piece it could have especially a big impact when it comes to Iran's nuclear facilities. Well, some interesting developments have been happening in parallel to this deal, which is that the, the nuclear talks between the US, others in Iran uh, haven't been going out anywhere for the past four or five months. They've pretty much completely broken down and the Iranians more or less walking away. At the same time, the IAEA, uh, the International Atomic Energy Authority, has said that the Iranians have reached 83.7% purity in their refined uranium. 90% is the figure commonly held to be enough to make a bomb. So first, first of all, for um, Saudi Arabia to sign a deal with Iran when this is going on is, as one former diplomat put it, a middle finger to the United States from Riyadh, uh, which is its principal ally in the region. It's really quite an astonishing development. And of course, the Israelis have always made clear, every single Israeli prime minister has said that what they regard as a flying holocaust, that is a nuclear bomb atop a ballistic missile that Tehran has control of, will not be allowed to take place. I spoke to Mark Regev, who's the former um, Israeli ambassador to Britain and perhaps the most prominent spokesman for Israel over many years, who said, um, whatever the, the domestic frictions and there's mass demonstrations against, against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the moment, Israel will always coalesce when there's an external threat and the security establishment is united about Iran. And they will take, in, in um, his words, whatever action they feel is necessary. That doesn't mean they're about to press the button on some massive and dramatic air raid. But there's been a covert war continuously um, for many years, assassinations, um, covert strikes. And I think we should be prepared to see an escalation of that if the Iranians take that further step and get to 90%. Now, Israel, um, according to Regev, Mark Regev, his conversation with me last night, um, doesn't think it can stop an Iranian nuclear weapon from being made, but it believes that perhaps it can put things back a few years, um, take them back to 70% or 60% purity, buy themselves four or five more years in which they hope something will turn up. Greg, how seriously should we take the threat of Iran using a nuclear weapon? You're in Jerusalem now. It feels like Israel has been warning for years about Iran's enrich, uh, attempt to enrich uranium. It's a good question, and it's a question that I'm not sure anyone has a, a great answer to. I mean, there is a very logical case that you can make uh, that Iran, even if it had a, a functioning nuclear weapon, and it's still months, if not years away from that, even if it made the political decision to build one, uh, it's still a ways away from that. There's a very logical argument for them not using it. This is a regime that, yes, is deeply ideological, has been deeply ideological since 1979, but even more than that, has shown itself focused on self-preservation. It's not a regime that is suicidal. Uh, it's a regime that in the 1980s drank what the then supreme leader called the poison chalice and uh, agreed to end the war with Iraq. Uh, it's a regime that has always placed its survival above everything else. To build and then use a nuclear weapon would be a suicidal act for the regime because it would invite uh, a response in kind from Israel, from Western powers, uh, and so I think the the assessment that many people have, including a good number of people here in Israel, uh, is that Iran wants a weapon not because it plans to use it imminently, but because it wants a nuclear deterrent. It wants to be able to prevent uh, foreign powers, by which, of course, it means uh, Israel and, and the United States, the, the great Satan and the little Satan, as Iran calls them. Uh, it wants to prevent them from being able to attack Iranian territory. And so that is the assessment of, of many people. Of course, that's not comforting for uh, Israeli policymakers because they still worry that even if Iran is not going to imminently use that weapon, uh, having a deeply ideological regime that is rhetorically committed to their destruction uh, 
armed with a nuclear bomb is an unconscionable scenario for Israeli policymakers. But uh, again, a, a good number of people within the security and intelligence apparatus here don't think that Iran is making a bomb with the intention of using it in the near term. But Greg, do you see tensions between Israel and Iran still worsening after this deal has been brokered? I do. I think the the deal, in some ways, you could say it, it represents a reversal of the trends of the past few years in the region. You go back to August 2020, and it seemed like uh, things were going in Israel's favor. They had signed uh, diplomatic agreements with the United Arab Emirates and then with Bahrain, uh, Sudan, Morocco. Uh, there was talk of other Arab countries, including perhaps Saudi Arabia, joining the Abraham Accords and normalizing ties with Israel. It seemed like it was consolidating its relationships in the Arab world uh, at a time where Iran was diplomatically isolated under American sanctions uh, and, and where its proxies in the region, groups like uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, uh, were, were not working together. That seems to have changed in, in the past few months. We've seen those proxies just in the past week uh, work together, as, as Paul notes in his piece, to fire rockets at Israel from three different fronts, from Lebanon, Syria, and Gaza. Uh, meanwhile, the Saudis and the Iranians are uh, talking with each other instead of being at odds with each other. Uh, so you can look at it on the surface and say that this hurts Israel's position in the region. That said, I don't think this agreement uh, fundamentally changes the way the Gulf states, Saudi in particular, view Iran. They still view it. Uh, as a threat, as a concern. They will continue to work with the Israelis as they have done for years, uh, building a, a discreet, in the case of Saudi Arabia, a discreet security and intelligence sharing relationship that has really flourished over the past decade. Uh, and so I don't think it, it fundamentally changes Israel's position in the region. The, the concern and, and the, the issue for Israel remains the nuclear program. And it seems like that is now unresolvable, and it's more complicated now, uh, the prospect of an Israeli strike on the Iranians, uh, now that the Iranians and, and the Saudis and the Iranians and the Gulf states are, are beginning to work together. Uh, and so that does complicate whatever it is Israel might be planning to do. And Paul, regardless of any deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel, Iran-backed militias are still going to be causing a lot of trouble in the Middle East. You write in your article for the magazine about a recent attack in northern Israel. Yeah, I think that's the, the immediate concern. As Greg was saying, we seem to be moving closer to Israel having to take action against the nuclear program. And this deal might be MBS's judgment that that's now inevitable and he doesn't want to have Saudi fingerprints on this whatsoever. He can say, look, nothing to do with us. We've got to deal with Iran or we've got relations with Iran. But in the meantime, you've got this um, intermittent back and forth across Israel's northern border. And what happened last week, I'm speaking to you from Beirut, we were rather alarmed to see quite a large volley of rockets and mortars going over the border from southern Lebanon, the biggest since 2006. Um, our immediate question was, is this Hezbollah? Because if it is and Israel hits back, then Hezbollah's got perhaps 150,000, 200,000 rockets, pick your estimate, that it can fire back and you're into uh, a full-scale war very quickly. It turned out to be Hamas, but Hamas is backed by Iran as well. Hamas's political leader, happened to be visiting Beirut and talking to the leader of Hezbollah when these rockets were fired. Um, it all felt like something coordinated and therefore I think quite threatening to Israel. So up until this point, the assumption's always been that Hezbollah doesn't want a war with Israel. I think it would be very harmful for Hezbollah to have that war. It would hurt its Lebanese base. But if you look at the organizational chart of Hezbollah, it goes back to Tehran. And if Tehran thinks it suits its interest to do this, then it will happen. I think the danger here is that both sides think they can carefully calibrate things. A few more rockets from the south of Lebanon, a bit more of a, um, a punishing uh, retaliation strike from Israel. But 2006, when a war blossomed out of almost nowhere, out of a small cross-border incident, shows these things get out of control very, very quickly. And this time around, both sides have got many more arms, many more rockets. And I think this would be a far bloodier engagement and one that's much more difficult for the United States and others to bring to a close if it starts. That's why paradoxically this peace deal, whatever we want to call it, normalization of relations between two enemies actually makes a bigger war much more likely, much more dangerous. And just to talk about the other players a little bit, Greg, the peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran was brokered by China, as Paul mentioned. The US has usually been the guarantor of agreements like this. Were you surprised that China was involved? I think everyone was surprised that China was involved. I think 
having said that, we shouldn't overstate China's role in this. Uh, the first part is the first point is the United States couldn't have actually negotiated this deal because the United States does not have diplomatic relations with Iran. It hasn't had diplomatic relations with Iran uh, since the the revolution in 1979. Uh, and so the idea that America could have been the broker of, of a Saudi Iranian deal uh, is is an unrealistic one. China also stepped in quite late in this process. The talks between the Saudis and the Iranians started uh, several years ago, first in Iraq. Uh, then they moved to Oman for a time because the, the Iraqi government was going through political paralysis at the time. Uh, and so there were talks in the, the Persian Gulf state of Oman. That was a process that went on with America's knowledge, with America's encouragement at times. So the Americans weren't completely frozen out of this. The talks only went to China uh, quite late and, and sort of went over the final hurdle in Beijing. I think partly for political reasons, because both Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, are very keen to build relations with China at the moment, particularly economic relations. This was an opportunity to hand the Chinese a very easy win, to walk in with what was almost at that point a concluded deal uh, and put Beijing in the position of, of being the host for the signing ceremony and uh, being the sort of guarantor of the agreement. It was a diplomatic win for China, a country that had not previously been that engaged in diplomacy in the Middle East, but but that was only the very end of the process. It was also, of course, for the Saudis who are frustrated uh, in recent years with America, who think it has been an unreliable partner. Uh, this was a way for them to send a message to the Americans to demonstrate once again, as they have before, that they're eager to cultivate relations with China. But those relations only go so far. Uh, there is a big economic relationship. There is a slowly growing diplomatic relationship with China. But the core of the Saudi-American relationship, the security part of it, uh, the Saudis, as frustrated as they are with America, recognize that they don't have anywhere else to turn at the moment uh, for a security guarantor. America is still the only address for that. Hmm. Still, Paul, the U.S. has moved one of its submarines, the USS Florida, to the Persian Gulf. Would people be wrong to assume that the U.S. is disengaging from the Middle East? I think there are tensions been elsewhere in Ukraine, perhaps Taiwan, or the perception's been that, and that's a very dangerous thing in the Middle East, perception can influence real events. Um, as Greg was saying, the United States still has the military clout. China doesn't have aircraft carriers, military bases, special forces on the ground. America is still the power that matters in that sense. But what this deal highlights is a shifting um, economic landscape. China is the biggest customer for Saudi oil. China is the biggest customer for Iranian gas. The United States now is self-sufficient in, in oil. And yet somehow American taxpayers uh, are paying this huge bill to maintain peace and security in the Middle East. Uh, American troops periodically risk their lives. You have to wonder if this will start to turn the debate in the United States. Why are we paying for China's security, China's energy security, uh, for China to import oil at our expense? Uh, I think this might be the shifting underlying reality in the Middle East, um, which will have a big effect somewhere down the line. But for the moment, yes, um, the fundamentals haven't changed, but you can see how things will change in the future. Hmm. Paul and Greg, thanks for joining me. And finally, Spectator contributor Mark Mason writes in this week's magazine about how he accidentally built his own coffin. To explain, Mark joins me now. Mark, you write for the magazine this week about making your own coffin. Tell us about that. It was supposed to be a boat? Well, it technically still is a boat. Right. It was made as a boat. My son found one of these YouTube videos, uh, which are normally aimed at practical men. I am completely impractical, but I looked at it and thought, even I could do this. It's uh, essentially a flat-bottomed boat. It's an open-top plywood box, eight foot by two foot by one foot. And I looked at the video and I thought, even I could do that and uh, managed to make the boat. Of course, my son got, he's 13, he got bored after about 10 minutes, but I carried you on. You stayed committed. I stayed committed through the nails. I used twice as many nails as I should. Some of them actually went through both pieces of wood like they're supposed to. I used loads of glue. I used enough bathroom sealant to protect the bathrooms from a whole housing estate. Uh, and incredibly, this thing actually floated. And so, of course, my partner was hoping as I set off from the riverbank on our local river, she was hoping it was gonna, it was gonna sink. And you and wouldn't come back. And I wouldn't come back. Or she back. wouldn't have to take the coffin the, back. The, the life, could be both, actually. Both, both now, if coffin. if it sank, then it would... I, anyway, let's not get into that. Um, it, it was floating. And then as I floated past, to her great disappointment, a few minutes later, I sort of lay down in it, because it's eight foot long. I could lie down in the thing. And the, there's a 45 degree angle at the front, so I was resting my head against it. 
And, and as I went past, she said, you look like you're in a coffin now. I thought, fair enough. Uh, but then I thought, why not? This could be my coffin. It's the only thing I've ever, meant, I've ever made. I didn't mean to make it as a coffin, but now that I've actually made this thing, I thought, yeah, in my will, I'm going to leave enough money for a piece of plywood to go over the top and some nails. And because it's my only moment of practicality in my entire life, I'm going to commemorate it by it being my coffin. Now, Mark, let me ask you why you're going to use this boat as your coffin. Uh, is it A, because you're so proud that you've built it? Yes. Clearly you are. Uh, <laughs> is it B, because you want to uh, use things in a multi-purpose way? You're being a bit thrifty here. Or C, is there a deeper philosophical point to this for you? Well, that makes me sound like a complete suit. But yes, there is a bit of the third element in there. In the, it's one of my great things. I've written about this for the magazine before. Mm -hmm. I did a piece a few years ago about death cafes, where people get together to talk about death and to accept the fact that we are mortal. When you think about it, it's incredible. It's the one thing that the human beings will not admit is that we're mortal. And it's the one thing that's certain in life. David Hockney has got this great phrase. He says, the cause of death is always the same. It's birth. The moment you're born, you know that one day you're going to die, but we'll never admit it. And that's why the response to COVID got grotesquely out of control. Mm -hmm. that nobody will admit that human beings are, are mortal. And we won't even use the word dead. Uh, and we won't talk about it. We won't, and if you accept it, if you accept that one day your life is going to end, that affects how you live your life. You become much more relaxed about it. You don't become a... I think that Donald Trump has not deep down accepted that he's going to die. That's one of his, that's why he's such a ridiculous figure. You think that explains a lot? Interesting. I think it does explain a lot, yes. Um, so this, I would say, is the crux of your piece for the magazine this week, that we sort of have to acknowledge as people our, our own mortality. But do you think you would have found such a joy in building your boat coffin had you set out building a coffin? Or do you think it's actually brought you more joy because you had this other purpose, which has made you think perhaps maybe a little more about your mortality? Yeah, it, like I say, it happened by mistake. Anything practical that I ever achieve in my life will happen by mistake. So you're not going to start building coffins for loved ones to remind them of their mortality? No, and okay. I'm glad that it doesn't look like a coffin. <laughs> I'm glad that it, uh, you know, it's not got the traditional angled shape to the sides of it. But I did think about it around the time I was building it. I was reading a brilliant book that came out last year by a guy called Rupert Callender, mm -hmm. who's uh, an independent undertaker. And his book called, is called What Remains. And it's his critique of, of, of the conventional undertaking industry and why he does the job the way he does it, which is he's very big on the, you know, you have to accept that you're mortal, being completely relaxed about it. Uh, one of the examples I give in the piece, not from his book, from my experience, is my brother went to a funeral where everybody met there 15 minutes before the coffin's gonna get there and next to the church was a pub. So they'd agreed that they were gonna meet at the pub. They'd all got their pint glasses and it was a funeral of a greengrocer. And he was, he was um, taken along, his coffin was taken along to the funeral in the back of his own van. They opened up the back doors and everybody there chinked their pint glasses against the coffin and then followed it through into the graveyard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a wonderfully relaxed, accepting attitude to death. Um, and I think that having your own coffin is, is, is a reminder of it. Nelson had his own coffin. When he won the Battle of the Nile, uh, a few years before he died, he, they got one of the, one of, some of his friends got one of the captured French ships and took some of the wood from it and made Nelson a coffin. And he was so chuffed with it. He used to keep it propped up in his cabin behind the seat where he used to eat dinner. Well, I don't think it was actually with him when he died, but... Uh, and the, uh, the other one I mentioned was um, missionaries. Yeah. Late 18th century, missionaries going to South America. Instead of packing their belongings in suitcases, they packed them in a coffin because they knew they wouldn't be coming back. So my accidental coffin, my boat, I might actually still use it as a boat one day, although it's a, it's a while now. I'm not sure how the sealant will be holding up. It <laughs> might not work. Uh, it's propped up behind the garden shed and it's because it's eight feet tall. I was going to ask where you're keeping this. It's behind the shed and just the top 18 inches or so stick out behind the shed. Just that so little reminder. When you look out of the window into the garden, <laughs> it's there as a reminder. And it's my equivalent of those um, people that were paid by victorious Roman generals used to pay someone to follow them around because they'd be getting praise from everyone. And they'd pay someone to whisper into their ear, ear all the time, remember, you're mortal. Mm. And that's what Donald Trump doesn't have. That's why it sort of keeps you grounded, literally keeps you grounded. You're gonna end up in the ground, well, wherever you end up. It's a reminder that one day your life's gonna to come to an end and it helps you not to take it too seriously. Well, this was my last question to you. What is the balance here? Because um, you know, coming to terms with your own mortality is one thing, but we have to take life somewhat seriously yeah. sometimes, uh, nor do we want to hurry the process <laughs> of going into the ground. So it sounds, like, it sounds like for you, the balance is 
out of sight, out of mind, but just creeping over where you can inches, see. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's not the it's not like the goths that I mean. Some people sleep in coffins, don't they, and get very very. You haven't slept but, in no, 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 this. I no. Well, I've nodded off in the back garden a couple of times when it's been lying when I've had it lying down. Right. But, you visit it from time to time. Yeah, just to remind okay. me. Yeah. Just to remind you. <laughs> but day to day. It's behind the shed. Just, yeah, those You're top, living your top, life. top few inches are there, and I'm getting on with my life, enjoying it all the more because I know that one day it's going to end. Mark, thanks for joining me. That's it for this week. If you enjoy Spectator TV, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss any of our videos. Thanks again for watching, and do join us again next week.